Hey, Deliberate Leaders. I am your host, Allison Dunn, founder of the Deliberate Leaders podcast, dedicated to helping leaders build strong, thriving businesses. Um, each episode we do is interviewing inspiring leaders to help you on your leadership journey. And today's guest is no exception. Um, joining us today is Jeff Hoffman. He is the uh, co-founder and former CEO of Priceline.com. He is also a public speaker and the best-selling author of Scale, Seven Proven Principles to Grow Your Business and Get Your Life Back. So uh, today, um, Jeff actually is the chairman and on the board of an organization, which is a nonprofit called Global Entrepreneurship Network. And do you call it Jen? Yes, Jen. Abbreviated. Okay, fantastic. Um, which is in 170 countries and um, is designed to make it easier for anyone, anywhere to start and scale a business. Jeff, welcome to the Deliberate Leaders Podcast. Thank you very much. Glad to be here today. Absolutely. We're um, stoked to have you. So I hope it's okay. I'm going to do a little breakaway of what I have been typically doing, and I'd like to just have a quick deliberate conversation about leadership. Are you game? Sure. Uh, absolutely. Awesome. Fantastic. So um, I kind of have a three-part question, and sometimes, you know, once you get going, you may answer all three at one time, but what would be your one top leadership tip? Um, surround yourself with people smarter than you. Uh, it's that I learned early on that one of the worst enemies of any leader is success uh, because as soon as you see yourself on the magazine cover, you suddenly think you must be a good leader and smart at this. Uh, and in fact, the truth is you got there because of the people around you. So surround yourself with people smarter than you and then lead by serving. Get out of their way and take care of them. For sure. Okay. So you've explained why it's important, which is my second question. So final question, how would you suggest that that is best implemented and practiced by our listeners? Okay. So that's a little bit longer answer because it's such an important question. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, what so many people do, so let's back up. The, 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 the task is find people smarter than you, uh, right? And then we can talk about the second part, how to serve them and how to retain them in a few minutes. But how to, re, how to acquire them is the first part. How do you find them? How do you surround yourself with those people? And what most people, what most leaders do, what most people do is use traditional channels to build a team. We might post a job we might talk to friends of ours in the network. We might hire a headhunter. And all of those methods uh, yield some degree of success. But here's a hard truth. The hard truth is typically, the, let's say you post it on a job site. Uh, typically, the person that is applying for a job is the person that recently lost theirs. Um, so... The, the, the rock stars in industry are rarely looking for a job. They usually have five deep lined up. Everybody wants to hire us. What you need is the rock stars of each mar of a segment, right? If it's a marketing person, a finance person. And the problem is those people aren't really looking for a job. They don't respond to the traditional job hiring methods or posting methods. And they're not going to just wander into your office. So my answer to your question is, you need to schedule time to go find them. So I used to do this sometimes two Fridays a month. I would pick two days a month where I was out of the office and I was talent hunting. I'm not sitting in my office posting stuff on the internet and hoping somebody magically replies. I am going out in search of the most talented people. And I'll tell you one quick example of that. I needed somebody amazing to run HR. I'm an engineer. And even though I was a CEO and a leader, I'm an engineer. I don't really have training in human resources and people management, but I needed the best. So I asked people, where do human resources people hang out? And people kept saying SHRM. And I was like, I don't know what SHRM is. So I looked it up, Society for Human Resource Managers. Um, so then I Googled it and I went to their website. And on the SHRM website, which I've never been on before, I'm not in HR, um, on the front page, it said, don't forget to register now for our upcoming national conference. So I registered and I paid my fee and I went. And when I got there, I don't know, 1,200 people or whatever, and you're all wearing a name badge. And I'm walking around and people are looking at my name badge and they're like, uh, what do you do? And I said, I'm a CEO. And they said, well, you're not even in HR. I said, I'm not. And they said, then what are you here for? 
And I said, shooting fish in a barrel. And they would laugh. And they would say, what do you mean? I said, let's see. There's 1,200 new of you, one of me, and I need someone to run my HR department. And here's the other amazing thing. Who are the speakers at a conference? Well, they're people like you, right? You speak on leadership at conferences. They're the people that know that are the best in that particular field. So you know what I did? I circled the names of the speakers, and I went and hunted them down at the conference. And the keynote speaker was Angela, who won the HR manager of the year for the United States. And after she spoke and she was done chatting with people, I managed to get her attention. And anyway, I'll skip the details, the interest of time, but she ran uh, HR for me for four companies. I was able to hire her at the conference. She was not looking for a job and everyone else, she had plenty of job offers. So you have to hunt for talent. You have to go where they are and you're going to have to get out of your office and go find them. Yeah. Very solid advice, Jeff. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so let's shift. Let's talk about your book, Scale. Who did, who did you write that for? So uh, I co-authored that with David Finkel. David had, David had written already eight business books, and I had written zero. Uh, so there would be no book without David. Um, here is the question we answered why we wrote the book. People kept saying, this is what I hear all the time. They say, I'm stuck. Okay, as a business owner, year one, we had a high growth, year two, year three, let's just say we grew from, you know, 100 grand a year to now we're doing 4 million a year in sales. And then we were at 4 million. And then last year, we we're at 4 million. And then this year, we're at 4 million. The two words I hear all the time is I'm stuck. I can't figure out I'm working harder, longer than ever. And I can't figure out why I'm not growing anymore. What am I not doing right? And or what am I doing wrong? that's preventing my business from achieving some exponential growth. So that is the question we were answering. We wrote the book Scale to make a practical how-to guide of the list of things that if you don't get these things right, you're never going to achieve that sort of hockey stick growth. You're not going to get unstuck if you don't do these things. Um, would you mind outlining kind of on a, like a high level what, the, what the, the critical steps are in Scale? Well, th there's a number, so I, w I won't take all that time, but I will hit a few of the highlights because one whole section we just talked about, uh, which is team building, yep. is that you need to spend some amount of your time, much more of it, working on your business and not in it, as people say, right? You're there running the business, taking calls, talking to people, going to meetings. That's in the business. On the business is taking a step back. It's me leaving every other Friday saying, I'm not even in the office today. Don't call me. I got to go find someone to run HR. It's taking a top-down view of how do you make this business stronger and you getting out of the flow of running the business. You're not at the meetings. You're not taking calls. You're working on the business that day. There's an example. We have a whole section on systems and processes as an example uh, about automating the things that are not your secret sauce. No one's coming to you because you do this one function. So automate it or outsource it. That, that's, and then we also talk about documenting processes so that we talk about onboarding. How, what is your onboarding process? When you hire a new person, how quickly are they up to speed? Well, if they're only up to speed as fast as they can follow another employee around and get and pay attention, take notes, that's not it. Onboarding should be as automated and documented, right? That, that you know, there, there's basically cloning your best employees in documentation and videos so that the new employee can emulate the best employee without the best employee being distracted from their job to train them. So these are examples of, there's basically seven chapters. We call them the seven proven principles to scale your company. Um, there's an example of a few of them right there. Okay. Fantastic. Um, in, um, in every company that I work with who wants to expand and scale in some way, um, creating the systems before they put people in place often is like the hurdle or one of the largest hurdles that I see them um, struggling to overcome. Do you have any um, recommendations on an easy way to systematize a business? And I don't, I know easy is kind of like a, a cliche term, but. Well, you know, uh, in a sense, we said one, which is to clone your best people. But if you don't have those people yet, right. um, to the case that you're talking about, it's much harder to do that. And then in that case, I really believe that it comes from creating community around you of similar leaders and similar business owners. Somebody 
uh, you know, if you're not part of an organization already that has forums, an EO or a YPO or Picket, um, there are a bunch of them, uh, you could create one on your own. I had somebody during Corona recently where I asked him to reach out to all the small business owners in the town he lives in that are roughly his size and form an every Friday Zoom call. And just Now, they're doing it because of COVID, but you should be doing that all the time. You should find a group. And, you know, in COVID time, we're asking people to call their competitors, too, because we've all got to get through this together. But in non-COVID times, calling somebody from each industry. If you're in fashion, call somebody from food services, somebody from IT, somebody from hospitality. Find companies and leaders of similar sizes with, of yours and so that you don't feel competitively, you know, nervous about sharing info and meet or talk regularly. Somebody has solved that problem. When you say, how do I systematize this process in my company? Someone else has already done it. So instead of guessing, you should be relying on the knowledge of the community and kind of crowdsourcing those questions. Yeah. Um, at Deliberate Directions, we have a similar EO style program called Whetstone. And um, I, I'd say that that shared knowledge of I've done that system and this is how we did it to learn from each other is powerful. So Yes. So people should be joining that so that they can learn from somebody that's already actually solved that problem that you have. And you probably have a solution, have a solution to something they're working on. Absolutely. Um, in the book, um, Scale, you talk about leverage points or areas of leverage. Um, can you um, kind of share a little bit more about what that is about and what, um, how to easily find or identify a company's leverage points? Um, well, that is kind of a multi-dimensional. Uh, we talk about that in a lot of ways. We talk about leverage for an industry as well. I'll give you a few examples um, because one form of leverage is something I've, I've you know, sort of since taken to call your unfair advantages, right? In some cases, people focus on leveraging, and this is kind of an update since we wrote the book, just so you know. Um, new content? Yes, this is pretty much new content. Um, in many cases, you are, or what I ask people to do is to sit down and, and you know, what you're gonna do is find your leverage by asking what unfair advantages, and I use that term unfair, obviously, everything's fair in business. What I mean by that is what unfair advantages do you have that other companies don't? What should you be leveraging in the market space? I'm going to give you a quick example. When we were, uh, uh, when I had a travel tech company, technology in the travel industry, the, the travel industry is written in a, in a programming language that is proprietary and for most of its life was undocumented. It takes like two years to learn it. And that's if you have really smart people. So one day I, we were talking about uh, the kinds of business deals we should pursue and we were looking to see where we had leverage. Well, it turns out that if you wanted to compete with me, you're two years behind. That's how long it takes just to learn, to train people in this very complicated back-end processing language. So that was a leverage point for us. That was an unfair advantage. I've already spent those two years. So pursuing a business idea that I have leverage in was me focusing on an area that I've got an advantage that you don't. When I'm bidding on the job, I can tell them, we've spent X six years already doing this. We'll be up and running faster than any of our competitors were. Relationships are a leverage point. And that same model, because I had delivered different products at a previous uh, position, um, and so, so had some of my employees to the same customers, CEOs of airlines, um, they trusted me. It was that a track record with them? So I had a leverage point in that, my team that they were betting on and hiring had proven performance to these customers in their industry. So those are some examples of unfair advantage leverage points that we look to exploit in our business so that we're pursuing the business we really are gonna win at. Um, I love the angle on really figuring out where the unfair advantage is. And I know that every company likely has one. It's just figuring out what it is. Yeah, yeah. you gotta think about it. it is. And I love your word. It is a deliberate process, mm -hmm. right? If you don't deliberately say, let us focus on and define our, our leverage points, it doesn't happen. You're too busy otherwise. Yeah, for sure. Um, obviously, scaling is a strategic type of investment. And so um, my question is, what are your thoughts on where companies may be over investing? Or, and maybe an example of where companies are under investing strategically? 
Um, do you mean in terms of, of, of investing in what part do you mean? Um, anything that causes scalability. So, um, Oh, sure. So, uh, uh, the under investing, let's start with that one. Cause that, that's the easy one, uh, which is in two in, 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 um, automating. Uh, a lot of times what people look at, <clears throat> I'm going to give you three, three answers to that question. Um, a lot of times what people look at is the cost of it and software products and SaaS products. And when I say, why don't you do that? They say, cause it's expensive. <clears throat> Excuse me. So they're under investing in these areas <clears throat> because of the initial outlay of the cost, forgetting that the month by month, you know, return on that investment is is often oftentimes dwarfs the initial investment. So they under invest because they don't want to lay out the initial cash in automating a process that once it is automated saves them so much money month after month. I'll give you a, you know just a crazy example of my first product ever. The first product I ever sold as a business was creating the check-in kiosks that you use at airports now. And the first couple of airlines oh, I went to, uh, I, right place at the right time. Um, I went to airlines and I said, you should buy these kiosks because then all these people in airports now, of course, they're in airports all over the world, but then they weren't. And people could check in. And some airlines said, how much do those cost? And I said, roughly this. And they said, less than our budget. So we don't want to spend more money. And so I said, okay, you spend X amount now to buy these. And then I had to do the analysis over the next five years, the number of personnel in the airport, you don't need to hire the number of counters, the number of check-in computers. I said, are you kidding me? It will cost you this much now in three months, it'll pay back. And the next, you know, 50 months will all be positive return on that investment. But all they said to me was, we don't have an IT budget to buy hardware right now. And I was like, what an insane decision. Of course, they eventually did. But some of them did not want to invest in automation because of the upfront cost, not doing the math over the long term. Um, another place people underinvest is in employee development. I can't believe how many employees tell me that their company gives, spends no money on continuing education or upgrading their skill set, right? I, I, I know some people that said, we think that artificial intelligence, well, we might be able to do predictive consumer behavior algorithms in our company, but we don't know what that are, what those are. And, you know, none of us have a certificate in applied AI. And because their company doesn't want to spend the money on training them on something they don't, quote, need. And so once they did, and what happened in COVID, that then during, during this time, a bunch of these AI, applied AI classes are free, which they're normally not. But... Once they invested in, in, in continuing education for employees, those employees were able to create new products that were worth way more than the cost of education. So those are examples of, you know, underinvesting in, in, in some of these areas. Uh, I think the overinvesting piece um, comes a lot from expansion. I'm going to say this. When I see people trying to scale their business geographically, and they're opening and building offices in other places. And when, without really exploring in a global world of uh, partnering, right? A lot of times they overinvest in access to market because they'll say there might be a company in Europe already that already exists, that already markets the same customers, a different product. But they'll tell me, well, we don't want to do that because they want 20% of every sale. So what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to open a Europe office and fly back and forth, but we're gonna get 100% of every product sale. I'm saying when you do the math, you, you would have been way smarter not to invest in your own physical expansion, but to just partner with someone who's already there and give them a cut of your revenues. Those are some examples. Yeah, those are very, very good examples. Um, in the... Um in the book, you also talk about uh, innovation. And so what are the most innovative brand promotional strategies that you've seen maybe in the last year or so? Can you highlight any so, kind of stands out? Yeah, they do. So uh, one of the, you know, I I'm gonna use the old term for this, uh, but because when it came out, they called it user created content, right? Now, if you think about it, look at all the really funny memes from parents uh, who are suddenly teachers in homeschool, right? I, 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 my favorite one, the first one I saw was the one that somebody said, 
how is homeschool going, question mark? And the woman wrote, uh, both students were suspended for fighting and the teacher was busted for coming to work drunk. Uh, so that was a meme created by an individual. There are, the power of the crowd is hilarious. When you look at the growth of new platforms like TikTok, even though it tends younger, it came out of nowhere because it's users, it's not YouTube, where everybody's watching every, somebody else's video, a small number of people create them. TikTok is an example, is everybody's creating their own little video because it's fast and cheap and easy. So user created content. So what I'm saying is challenging, this is my favorite new strategy, challenging the world at large to make a funny video about your product, right? So they're all out there promoting your product for you. And if the video, the video is funny, funny, it goes viral. And in the process, everybody sees your product. An example, even though it wasn't a commercial product, was the ALS ice bucket challenge. Who doesn't know what the ice bucket challenge is? But that wasn't, yeah. that wasn't a random thing. That was ALS, right? The foundation put out a challenge and everyone knew about the ALS ice bucket challenge. So that trend is one that excites me the most. Why don't you challenge the world to talk about your product by doing something funny online? They love making funny memes. They love making funny videos. Why don't you ask them to? Yeah, that's a brilliant idea. I hope that's the takeaway from everyone who's listening, who's going to be listening to this podcast. That's the challenge. Um, you talk about or recommend info sponging, which I think is such a fun term um, for 20 minutes a day. So can you tell our audience a little bit about what info sponging is? Sure. So I just made the word up because people asked me what I was doing. <laughs> and so that's where info sponging came from. Um, the concept was this. I was studying my business heroes. Why are some of who I think are the, the brightest and the most innovative people, what is it they're doing that everybody else isn't? And so, for example, Steve Wozniak from Apple became a friend. And spending time with Steve and people like that or when I would be with Richard Branson or whatever, uh, just business innovators, I would try to see what habits they have that everyone else doesn't. And one of the ones I noticed is everybody else sticks to the industry, their industry. If you're in the real estate industry, you don't really care what they're doing in banking. If you're in banking, you really don't care what, you know, what the retail mall industry, whatever. Um, everybody tends to focus on, you know, you wouldn't go to conferences for other industries in the same way sort of that I went to a HR conference. I'm not in the HR business, but um, when I notice these innovative people, they are constantly looking to see what the rest of the world around them is doing to see literally if there is a good idea they can steal to apply to their industry. So I created this concept of info sponging to say, uh, every here's your task. Every single day, you should challenge yourself to learn one new thing today that you don't need to know. For 10 minutes, 20 minutes a day, you are not in the real estate industry and you do not work for your company. So for those 20 minutes, you have to learn one new thing, read one new article, one new story, one new magazine, one new conversation with someone that is not about real estate and is not with anyone you work with. And at the end of these, in the info sponge time, I write down one sentence of what I learned that day. And what happens over time is you start to collect ideas from other industries and other people that are not in your industry and not in your company. And you wind up being the first person to figure out how to use that great idea in your industry. That is what the common element of these great innovators were, uh, was that they took ideas like the example being, uh, you know, Travis looking at the, uh, the sharing economy and micropayments and task-based freelance work and putting all these ideas together, none of which came from the taxi business, putting them all together into something called Uber. He didn't create Uber by looking at taxis. He created Uber by looking at ideas that other industries had and said, well, wait, these things are cool. How do I use them in my industry? Um, are you okay if I put you on the line? What did you info sponge today or yesterday? Um, yesterday, I was looking at, yesterday I had a very specific one uh, because I was looking at something in Uganda and I was looking at the supply chain of, feed, of food in Uganda, but specifically to schools because there's a lot of kids there than there are in our country um, whose only food supply actually comes from the school. The government delivers food to the school, not to the individuals. And while school is closed because of COVID, the government's also closed, so no food is flowing. And so I was trying to understand. That made me wonder, 
I didn't know any of that. Just in general, I wondered how food does food get to them? They don't have a car and they don't have a grocery store. Not like we do. So in general, how do they get their food every week? Where do they get it from? What is the food supply chain in a country like that? That is actually what I was researching yesterday, all the way down to uh, chatting on WhatsApp with some people in Uganda to see if there was something to, we can do to help. And the process of that made me start to think of, if we had a solution to that, what other supply chains could that be applied to uh, for moving goods or food in other parts of the world as well? Cool. That is, um, that is a challenge, I think, that I don't know if we're going to solve it today, but can you imagine that? I can't imagine that. It's important. It is very important. So you, you are also um, a consultant as well as a coach, correct? Yes. Correct. Um, what would you um, say is the most common? So I, I think I know the answer because I think you brought it up earlier, but what is the most common challenge that you're coaching someone over? Yeah, so it, it is the one I brought up earlier. The one people who come to me because, you know, our expertise is scale. Several of our companies I was involved in scaled globally and, and became large companies. And so that's the one people ask me. I can't figure out why I'm not growing. Why am I not hitting a growth ramp? Why did my growth plateau? Um, that's one uh, the, the, that people come to me. They want explosive growth and they can't figure out how to get there. Um, and or at least exponential growth. So I would say that's the first one. Um, along those same lines is expanding into new geographies. People are like, how do I go global with my product? That's an area, that's a common one that I get a lot in an increasingly more global business world. Um, strategic partnerships is one. How do I form, how do I get these big giant players in the industry to want to do business with me? I'm not big. How do I, how do I cut a partnership deal? And then I would say the last one is more about the one we talked about, which is how do I attract and how do I retain the top talent? Those are the ones that people usually ask me. Um, I don't know if this is, I kind of feel like it's a separate question, but maybe they're the same answers and that's okay if they are. Um, when you're working with the business owner and helping them with this um, exponential you know, desire for growth, um, what kind of challenges do you find it when you get a chance to work with their teams? Is it similar or different? No, they're similar. Uh, I'm going to give you two words, trust and empowerment. You as the leader, tell them, I believe in you. You're my new, uh, you know, right hand. You're my VP of everything, whatever it is. You tell them that and you do not behave that way. You tell them that, that, that you trust them and you believe in them, but you do not empower them. They still have to call you to get approval for a major decision. They still feel like if they made a mistake, they would be fired. They still feel like, they cannot fail or their jobs at stake, even though you have failed many times. They do not believe that you trust them and they do not feel empowered no matter what words you're using. Your actions and your words do not match. That's what I see the most is people don't scale. I always say this, you can't scale until you get out of the way. You can't get out of the way until you actually trust and empower people. And everyone says, I am doing it. Look at this email I wrote. You know, sitting on this conversation I had, and I tell them, those are your words. Your actions don't match that. Your actions are, wait a minute, you told the people in London, what? why didn't you call me? Why wasn't I on that call? Why didn't you run it by me? And so they're not trusted and they're not empowered. Until you can actually allow somebody to fall, not on purpose, but until, you, until that happens and without you reacting, like saying, you know, that old adage, if you want something done right, do it yourself. That's the worst advice you could give a leader that wants to grow. Yeah. Yeah. Ex excellent. Uh, excellent. Descriptive trust and empowerment. Super important. Um, I am just fascinated by the work that you're doing um, with your global entrepreneurship network. And so um, I'd li just like for you to kind of share with us exactly what type of projects is Jen solving or promoting? Um, our focus now is on the ecosystem itself. Uh, entrepreneurship is a lonely game. So many of us know that. Um, we need support from everywhere, whether it's policy and government, like tax regulations, hiring laws, immigration laws, whether it's the city we live in, like I can't afford rent and there's an empty building down the street. Why can't I use offices there? Whether it's education uh, from organizations like yours or even universities, preparing students for entrepreneurship as a career so you can hire them. Um, funding, 
So the talent pools I was referring to, funding. Why aren't there more business angels in my community? There's only, there's only high-end VCs or banks or people that won't loan money to anyone who actually needs it, uh, or they don't want to do an equity investment. Those are all pieces of the ecosystem. At Gen, our focus is on strengthening and building ecosystems everywhere in the world. So if you start a business, all the things you need around you to launch your business actually exist where you live. That's our focus. That is no small mission. So um, No, it's not. Um, what would be the easiest way for any listeners who are interested in either getting involved and or helping? Like, what would that look like? Or Sure. So on that organization, it's genglobal, G-E-N global.org. That's our website. Uh, my email is just jeff at jeffhoffman.com. Um, and there's plenty, uh, plenty of opportunities to get involved. Uh, we, we need, you know, we meaning entrepreneurs in the world and small business owners uh, need all the help we can get. Cool. Um, with this coronavirus, you know, obviously it has uh, created a massive um, shift and disruption on what's going on in the way we work and live. Do you have any... Um, sage advice or guidance or recommendations for business owners right now? Yeah, I have published something called my three R's, um, which I will send you a copy of. You can post uh, on your website for your listeners as well. Uh, but that came from talking to literally hundreds and hundreds of small business owners all over the world during this last month and a half during all this. And the three R's are repurpose, retool, and redeploy. Repurpose means looking at the skill set you have, the capabilities you have in your existing company, and trying to see if you can use your skills to solve some COVID-related problem. Um, and, and so, you know, an example would be a small business owner that I work with that owns a small distillery. She makes vodka for a living, um, and no one's, the, the doors are closed, so she has no business right now. Um, but their skills and their tools were able to repurpose to make hand sanitizer. And now they're selling out and she's hiring like crazy uh, because everyone in the world needs hand sanitizer. She repurposed her business to do something her business could do to help. Retooling, you and I actually talked about, retooling is a chance to add new skill sets to your business during this slow time. And I gave you the example of a consumer goods company where all the employees got new certificates and applied artificial intelligence and they're building predictive behavior, AI algorithms for their company that they'll be up and running by the time they go back to business full time. And then redeploy is really loaning your employees who have usable skills to people in your environment uh, that, that could, in your ge geography, they could use it. Again, an example being a tech company I know that's kind of shut down now because they have nobody buying software but they have graphic designers on their staff and they loan them to a hospital. The graphic designers offered to create graphics for a hospital to get communications out about, uh, about coronavirus right now. So that's redeploying. So repurpose, retool, redeploy uh, are my three R's for what business owners should be doing now. Yeah, and I think that going forward, that is always applicable, so brilliant. I do too, if it's just, it's just magnified. If you share that with me, I will make sure that it gets um, uh, added to the actual posting itself. Sure, I will email that to you right when we're done. Thank you, Jeff. Um, first, I just want I just want to thank you. I want to make sure if anyone wants to follow you, you've provided your email and the website. But if they were to actually follow you as a fan, where is your favorite, you know, channel? Uh, honestly, LinkedIn. Okay. I'm on LinkedIn more than anywhere else. Um, okay. And you know, the LinkedIn.com, I'm slash Jeff Hoff, J-E-F-F-H-O-F-F -F -F is my profile. Usually, if people, there's a lot of Jeff Hoffmans, it's a common name. So if you put in like Jeff Hoffman Priceline, it finds me fast. Okay, fantastic, excellent. Well, I uh, very much appreciate you spending time with us here today and um, just appreciate all of the work that you're doing with your Gen Network and, um, um, sharing your guidance with us today. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Everybody stay safe. Thank you. And whatever you do, be deliberate.